WWDC starts next week. And if you're anything like me, you're impatiently waiting for the keynote to start to get all the newest updates. In this video, I'm going to share some predictions and tell you how I am preparing for WWDC, what I'm expecting and what I'm hoping for. There's a little bit of guessing involved, so don't count me on it. You can always write in the comments your own opinion or what you're looking for in WWDC. If you're new to this channel, my name is Karin and I have started learning iOS development five years ago. WWDC 2019 was my first one when Swift UI was announced. There's a lot of updates every year coming. I'm going to break a couple of them down because this is going to be a longer discussion. I added some timestamps in the description box so you can jump ahead to the sections that are interesting to you. <laughs> okay, let's grab some coffee and start this discussion. So the first presentation is where they talk about all the operating systems and how they update their system apps. They're probably going to add a lot of AI features. The interesting thing about this is they haven't really talked much about AI. Only during the last release of the new iPads did they talk more about AI. Since this is only one month back, I'm suspecting there's more in this direction for iPad. Apple is really good at small enhancements for the user experience, just sprinkling it in where it really makes sense. Windows recently announced their new Copilot, and funnily enough, usually Windows users are, let's say, more conservative in what new features they like. And when I was watching this one guy, he's like, I do not want to have AI in my messaging app. I do not want to have AI in my photos app. I do not want to have AI in my email app. And it's kind of a funny situation that people who are usually not so interested, Windows users, get so much AI stuff. And on macOS, because these are people who are usually more tech savvy and want to have the newest features, I would have expected AI to be much more present than on Windows. One thing is for sure, they are going to improve Siri, which I mean, they really have to. It has been pretty bad since forever because Apple only has this opportunity to update these operating systems once a year with WWDC and then the release in September. They are probably going to announce a lot more stuff, but that will not be directly available during the release. They will just slowly release this. Probably some stuff is only coming by the end of this year. Maybe even Siri. The one thing that Apple always highlights is the privacy concerns. And if they like OpenAI, for example, use some cloud servers to process the response for Siri, then they really need to uh, explain why and how they are doing this. Apparently they are building some data centers currently with a lot of M3 Ultra chips that would then process the data. If you have a device with more powerful chips, for example, the M1 to M3 chips, Mac and which are for Macs and iPads, they can do a lot more on-device processing, which is great if you have a Mac. This probably also should help them finally getting rid of the few people who are still on an Intel Mac. I don't really know who that is because M1 chips have been so popular. The most important user base is for iPhones. This is like 50% of their revenue comes from iPhones. And the current iPhones apparently are not good enough to process data on them. So these ones definitely need to offload their processing to a data center. It seems some of the newer iPhones that are coming in September, the iPhone 16 Pro, they will be able to do the on-device processing. The good thing for Apple, even if you don't buy a new device and you rely on the cloud processing, this is still good business for Apple. I'm pretty sure they're going to charge quite a bit for this, similar to their iCloud service sector. Apple's revenue share for services is around 26%. And if they go into the AI space, this is probably going to be a lot bigger. Similar to processing for the iPhone, they probably do it for the watch, just because then you have a capable Siri AI assistant that actually does what you ask it to do. Obviously, they will also have some enhancements for having an AI assistant JTTP, which is probably what's going to happen in your notes app or image processing, video processing everywhere. They are probably going to talk a lot about the iPhone and iOS 18. Then if you look at the other operating the systems, the other devices, we have Vision Pro. I am not a big fan. I don't really care. Apparently, they're going to release the Vision Pro finally in Europe. Although this is like four months after the US, the hype has died a little bit and I'm not really sure if this is going to keep it up. But yeah, if you have a Vision Pro app, this is good news for you because then your user base grows quite a bit. 
Then the other two big platforms after iOS is actually the iPad and the Mac. Because they just released the new iPads, I'm expecting quite a lot of things, especially something for the new Apple Pencil. So the squeeze function, how they integrate this maybe with shortcuts into their operating system. And probably iPad OS is getting more Windows support, more like Mac OS. Maybe some improvements for Finder. When they released Stage Manager for the iPad, they also made it available for Mac OS. So sometimes they develop new UX design patterns for one platform and then they, try, they use it also in the other ones. So maybe what I'm hoping is that they learned a lot of things for Vision OS because they also have Windows that they then can also use for the iPad and the Mac. For the macOS system, I obviously care the most, I guess, about Xcode. Maybe we get some AI assistant, some more nice features in Xcode. And then the last ones are variables. This would be, for example, the watchOS. They are probably, as I said, having an AI assistant. People who have a watch care mostly about health. So they are probably having an AI health assistant, an AI health coach, a trainer, something of this sort. Okay, let's now continue and talk about what's going to come for the developer keynote. So obviously they're going to release a lot of new APIs and features. There will be more AI. They already had some talks before about how to train a model, how to use the system, some of the AI inside. I mean, they obviously did not use the word AI. They used more like machine learning. They indeed have some processing on the device, for example, on the Mac or the iPad, then it's interesting to see what models they have. They have probably have going to have a lot of different small ones, one for image editing, one for voice, one for languages. And then we are going to get some APIs where we can tap into these models so we can use this also for our own apps. This probably also includes quite a bit of privacy concerns and settings. Whatever settings I have to add in my info list again, because this is getting a little bit out of hand. Hopefully they make it a little bit easier. I don't mind to have some privacy and explain why I want to use certain features. It's just the way it's implemented currently in Xcode is a little bit painful. Then obviously we'll see some updates to Xcode. The thing with adding more features, it can make the apps more bloated and crashing. So I really hope they've managed to do this because Xcode is already a handful. The other thing with this AI that might be interesting is, as I said, we have some existing models that we probably can use. But for if you have a use case where you would like to train the data more specifically, it would be really cool to see if you can use one of Apple's models some GTTP version, train it, and then put it also on the cloud in one of these data centers. And then, so they could host it and you can directly much easier use this kind of technology now. Obviously you would need to pay for this, which is also good for Apple. <laughs> then they will probably going to talk a lot about enhancement or what's new in Swift UI, UI kit and app kit. In the last years, I didn't really get super excited about this. Maybe with the years you go on and you're like, it's actually not, I mean, there's small things, but nothing groundbreaking really. I'm guessing they're going to hone in more and more on Swift UI. I have to say the one thing that I really want is a rich text editor in Swift UI. Maybe this year is finally going to happen. Who knows? I'm not giving up hope. I'm also guessing they're going to have more updates for Swift data because they only released it last year and was it felt like really early and pretty much not done yet. So maybe this year it's going to be finally capable also to replace core data. For example, some stuff like uh, in your Swift UI in your apps, the support for section fetch requests, better filtering options where your app does not crash. That would be nice but also maybe properly supporting UIKit and AppCat to use this together because this is a little bit strange. And then the other thing is maybe having support for public databases similar to core data. Then the main thing they're wanting us to do is to adapt for the updates to the operating systems. They're probably going to push quite a bit for VisionOS because they know they need... One of the big complaints for VisionOS is that they don't have a lot of apps. And they obviously need you and me to make these apps. I don't really think it's worth it right now because the user space is not there. It's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. If you don't have a lot of apps, people don't come. If you don't have people, 
developers won't make apps. It's a little bit risky. You might get lucky and publish an app that really takes off, but the risk is quite high. So be just aware if you want to make a visualized app. Then obviously for the iPhone, they're going to spend a lot of time. How do you use also these AI features in your apps? Strangely enough, not so interested in the iPhone. It's not my favorite platform. Maybe that's why I'm more a iPad and macOS person. So let's talk about the iPad. The, as I said, we have the new iPads and the Apple Pencil features. You can implement the squeeze feature in your app. This is supported for iOS 17.5. So you can have a look at the how to um, do some actions when the user uses the squeeze feature, for example. A lot of people for the iPad actually complain that, again, there's not so many apps or not so many power apps to make it like a macOS replacement. And then I was thinking, they, in order to fix this for the Mac or they try, when they try to fix this for the Mac, they introduced Catalyst, which takes a iPad app and makes it a macOS version. They also run natively iOS Silicon apps on the Mac. So maybe they could also do a reverse catalyst version where you have a Mac app that you then can port over to the iPad. Obviously we have some tweaks to adjust the button size for the touch input. That's going to be interesting. The good thing is Apple is actually really good with the UX design. They introduced this changes small, but usually they are quite user friendly and not like Windows where it's just annoying. When they did Windows 8, which everybody hated because it's just tiles, the iPad probably is not going to be able to run macOS, but we might still get some enhancements that go in the direction of macOS. And I am hoping that they have some more control over Windows. This would also obviously benefit macOS. So we have more support in Swift UI for Windows support where you can actually position Windows, you know which windows are open, just uh, getting more flexibility in this direction. If it doesn't happen, I'm still having one more hope. <laughs> which is that the European Union, one of the rulings, was to open the App Store for the iPhone apps. I don't think this is making a big difference because people are just too used to on the App Store. But if it's for the iPad, for users who come from the Mac, on the Mac, I have like half of the apps that I have, I downloaded from a website. Some of the apps, it's also not possible to uh, put in the App Store because of Apple's restrictions. For example, like clean my Mac apps. They just need to have so much system access that Apple would never allow this. So we have on the one side people who are used to downloading apps from a website on the iPad, which might be more natural, so they're more inclined to do it. And also people having more need to actually get better apps, better software to take advantage more, to make it a pro device with pro apps. And the good thing is that in the European Union in six months, so in November, they allow also for the iPad to download software from a website. This might be a really good opportunity for some of you guys as developers to have some pro apps for the iPad coming soon. So you can actually ask pro prices for your software. If it makes it so much more useful, somebody paid $2,000 for a device. Are they really going to be cheap on a $30 software that makes the device so much better? Probably not. Let me know what you would like to have for the iPad, what enhancement you want to have. Because now, even if Apple does not give us this, we might be still able to get it to have this workaround. And then obviously they're going to talk about watchOS and macOS. For macOS, again, I want to have more window control. This is one of my favorite platform, so I care. And then maybe drag and drop and file management, drag and drop file types around in your app outside. They were trying, but it still feels messy. Let's hope for uh, a little bit of an easier work. This is also helpful for the iPad, obviously, and then for Vision OS, because you might also want to change, pass things around on the Vision OS. Now, lastly, I want to talk about the rest of the WWDC week. They are going to release the public betas on Monday after the keynotes. Please, there's every year people who directly install it on their main devices. Please don't do this because they're just really buggy. So don't do it. For example, just to give you a reason why you wouldn't do this, especially if this is the first WWDC for you. If you have an iPhone that you use for 
banking and this app crashes for some unknown reason with the new betters, then, then you might not be able to do some online banking, not being able to pay some expensive cat food. And then what happens? Your cats have to eat supermarket food. That would be a disaster. So please don't do it. If it's not your main device, if it's on a second Mac or if it, you have an iPad, then obviously you can install it. If it's not a super important device. This year, what's new with the videos, they also have a YouTube channel. So you can watch them there. Unfortunately, they did not allow comments, which is something that I really care about or seeing the discussion between other people of what they like and what they don't or what they didn't understand. I still think it's better to actually use the developer app because there you see the transcript, the timestamps and also the code snippets, which is very nice that I added this recently and also other related presentations. So make sure you update your developer app in time. So it doesn't crash when everybody else wants to update it. The great thing about WWDC is that the whole Apple developer community is really active. If you want to see what other people are interested in, one of the best places to be is on Twitter. So you can also follow me on Twitter to see what's going on and what everybody's talking about. Then there's two more things I'm looking forward to. The first is the developer labs. So you can have a one-on-one -on -one call with Apple developers. The Swift UI labs are usually super popular. So you have to make sure you subscribe in time on Monday or whenever they open this. Also, so you don't get a time slot at 3 a.m. in your time zone. The other thing I really liked in the last years is the digital launches, where they open Slack channels with different topics for each of the presentations. So you can, after they release the videos, actually ask the people that present about some stuff. And they are quite active in this with answering a lot of questions. Even if you might not know what to ask, it's super interesting to see what people find and what problems there are, what technologies, what features they're looking into. So just make sure you join the Slack channels to get all these cool interactions. They're keeping it open for some time afterwards, so you can also later go through and just have a good read. There's a lot of things that is going to be published during this week, so just make sure you do not get carried away too much. You have all summer until the release of iOS 18 and the other platforms to make sure your apps work for the new systems. Lastly, during WWDC, there's usually a lot of sales going on. So if you're interested in any books or courses for SwiftUI, iOS development, you name it, just have a look. This is a great chance to get a good deal on any of your favorite books that you were looking into for some time. I'm also running a sale for the next two weeks. So you can head to my website and check it out. If you want to learn more deep dive into Swift UI layout, macOS development or core data, I wish you a good DubDubDC. Have fun, enjoy the community events. Until next time, happy coding.